Good day, everyone. Um, we are in Den Haag today at the Climate Adaption Summit 221. Um, one of the prominent participants to the summit is the former CEO of these, um, Mr. Fike Sibisma. Mr. Sibisma is willing to address a number of my questions in his capacity of co-chair of the Global Center on Adaption. Mr. Sibisa, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. My pleasure also. Thanks, Paul. The summit is much about adaption and not so, about, not so much about mitigation. Would you mind to explain why? Well, climate change is impacting all of us. We know that. And we anchored our approach on climate change during the COP five years ago in Paris. Uh, to take care of mitigation, uh, preventing that climate change would really hurt us further. And we need to conclude that five years later we are not yet or not on track of our own commitments of five years ago. And in the meantime, climate change is continuing and impacting the most vulnerable countries. It's also impacting our country in the Netherlands, but many developing countries uh, in an enormous way, in food production, in flooding and droughts, etc. And therefore, we need to work on adaptation as well uh, in order to uh, make them resilient and to take care that the world will further prevent climate change via mitigation, but also deals with the impact of climate change already today. So what we need to do is developing technologies, innovations, how to grow our crops in uh, times uh, that are droughts or floodings or how to protect cities or how to protect infrastructure. Uh, and that is the adaptation agenda. Next to the mitigation agenda, we need to continue as well. Listening today, I thought everyone was pretty excited about John Kerry joining. Yeah. Um, and in particular also the recommitment by the Biden administration to, um, to the Paris Treaty. Is the U.S. that important that they rejoined forces to combat climate change and also adaptation? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, we had the famous Paris Agreement uh, uh, five years ago and almost a year afterwards, uh, the U.S. said uh, we withdraw. Uh, and the U.S. is, of course, a very big country with a lot of companies. And, uh, and it was not helpful, of course, if the U.S. withdraws. So we are all very excited and happy that Biden and now fighter climate envoy John Kerry uh, rejoined uh, the Paris Agreement. And both, again, on mitigation, but since climate change is a reality today, also the help on adaptation. And we need to do more because we are spending globally, all companies, cities, governments, etc., uh, to make ourselves resilient, to protect ourselves about 30 billion a year, but it's, and last year it went down, whilst we need to increase it at factor 10 in the coming uh, years in order to cope with it. And therefore we need also the help of the US, we need the companies on board, we need the country on, on board, uh, because we need to do much more. And I think um, the developing countries who are really hurt uh, already today, and we cannot say that they caused the climate change. We caused in the West most of the climate change of today. So we have a responsibility also to those developing and most vulnerable countries. To build on your words, uh, we have to do more. I think one of the main takeaways of today is call for action, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I would assume that we have been tested somewhat in relation to COVID. But could we say that COVID has just been a rehearsal compared to the challenges ahead of us as a result of climate change? Well, I think there are differences and similarities, of course, with COVID, and I want to be careful uh, to one to one link it. But uh, at least what we have seen in COVID, that the global collaboration uh, has been very difficult. Uh, many countries fought for themselves in mouse mask or tests, etc. And, uh, and this needs collaboration. Uh, so yeah, we were tested uh, the last year. Can we uh, collaborate? But can we also collaborate to something which is hugely important, can have a huge impact already today, 
Uh, but it's also moving slowly, uh, and the world uh, reacts uh, with a slow speed to slow development sometimes, and that's not good. And once climate change will impact on us even stronger, we cannot say, oh, we didn't see that coming. We know uh, uh, all of it already for years, so we need to address it. Just referring to you saying the world is slowing, of moving slowly, uh, that's maybe also due to the fact that certain commitment made in 2015 in relation to bringing financial resources together are apparently not met. Who should be the drivers to meet those commitments? Should it be governance? Should it be businesses? Or do you see other stakeholders that have to stand up? It's a, it's a very good question. All those, uh, also today, all those uh, big conferences, uh, there are state actors uh, who are in the lead of the commitments of the Paris Agreement, now the Adaptation uh, Summit, etc. But at the end of the day, it is not the public sector only, even stronger. The majority of the investments, the majority of the money spent, need to come from the private sector. So the public sector need to set policies to get the private sector on board, like a price on carbon or whatever. Uh, the public sector should call up the responsibility uh, of the private sector to do something. Because indeed, uh, the private sector need to do a lot. They need to spend a lot of money, not only also out of moral obligations, but also out of self-interest. I mean, the private sector need to protect its own supply chains in the agriculture, in, in other uh, ways. Uh, the private sector need to pre protect its own locations and sites that sometimes are, are in danger. Uh, to protect its own employees. Uh, if the only employees have no access to water, why would they come to work? So it is in the interest of the private sector also to invest, uh, to contribute, uh, to protect their own uh, businesses. And whilst doing that, taking up a moral responsibility for the world as well. Like you and I shared also before, uh, the economy in the private sector never developed itself with a focus on making money. I mean, the private sector started, the economy started with barter trade. You do this, I do this, we exchange goods. Oh, we are with three, four people, we need to invent something to trade, gold, money, computers, whatever uh, we, we, we find out to trade our competences. Uh, but making money is a means, is a facilitator, and, and therefore there is a responsibility uh, to contribute uh, to this world, of this generation. And it's interesting, and today some of the younger people said, well, we contributed less to climate change, most likely we're paying a bigger part of the bill. And that's true, so it's our generation who has the responsibility as well. Please allow me to, to follow up on, on carbon pricing. Um, I think the Secretary General of the UN today um, make reference to it. Yeah. I think you have been advocating on carbon pricing. Please feel free to share some thoughts in that respect, especially because carbon pricing will be on the agenda in November on the COP26. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in the COP, again, mitigation will be discussed and adaptation will be discussed. Carbon pricing is a tool, I think, to mitigate um, and to uh, transform ourselves faster to a low carbon uh, economy. And there are many surveys, and I've led one of the uh, uh, bigger studies uh, with the High Level Commission on Carbon Pricing, um, a price on carbon of about 30, 50 towards $100 uh, dollars per tonne will help tremendously the business sector from a financial perspective just to invest in a low carbon economy, in an energy transition and to change uh, their own emissions and reduce them fast. So it's a very effective tool. Now the big question always is, okay, uh, if it is an effective tool, will it go at the cost of the economy, cost of jobs, cost of competitiveness? And what we have seen, well, if we do it globally, uh, we all have the same burden in all, all places, so it doesn't matter competitiveness. Um, 
But the report uh, with, and the study we have done shows that it uh, will uh, reduce or it will impact uh, competitiveness and jobs. Very limited, even on jobs, the reverse. A new economy, a greener economy will provide a lot of jobs. So uh, it is an argument, uh, jobs, economy, competitiveness, often used against carbon pricing, uh, but there are not many data that that argument is, is correct, to be honest. And therefore, uh, like Gutierrez also said today, it's a very effective tool. Now, Europe has an, a system, an ETS system of carbon price between 20 and 25 today. Some states in the US have it. Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile uh, have a price of carbon. In a modest way, China, uh, South Africa, Singapore. So more and more parts of the world uh, are putting a price on carbon and it will be interesting to see what the US will do in, in the coming period. Conscious of time, uh, maybe two final questions. Um, I think one of the takeaways for me today is that I think I'm allowed to say that climate change is on the agenda of all countries. However, uh, what also is my takeaway of today uh, that a number of car, uh, countries, but particular parts of the world, are affected by climate change um, on first. Yeah. And uh, secondly, on the other hand, that they don't have the resources available to challenge those, 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 those changes uh, by themselves. Yeah. So you have been referring to what businesses could do. Um, but if you may call out to the more fortunate countries to the world. What should they start doing tomorrow? The more fortunate uh, countries or the more fortunate companies as well uh, should take up a moral responsibility because we have been benefiting from our own emissions where the effects of that is now more seen in the developing countries who have not uh, benefited from the positives and now get only the adverse effects. So we have a strong moral responsibility. But once again, it is also just uh, common sense. If we don't help the developing countries, how can we uh, prevent further mass immigration from, for example, Africa to Europe? Or if we don't uh, um, uh, adjust ourselves, how can we protect our own supply chains and our own businesses? So for me always, this is a, a combination uh, for businesses of just common sense and for countries as well, um, and, and a moral responsibility. And, and I hope uh, we take both. And I'm very glad that you, as your company, uh, make this a very important topic and see how your business uh, from a completely different angle uh, can contribute to this. And I hope that many businesses and many companies uh, do the same and think, hey, how could we contribute? And most likely it will benefit you also, good. And it is also uh, an engagement to your own people uh, or to uh, uh, hiring new people. So it is a total systemic approach, I think. Final question. Um I think the exciting thing also about this summit is that uh, youngsters are participating yeah. to that. And um, uh, you made reference to the youngsters before. Is there a particular message you like to send across to them um, to keep them committed and encouraged and energized uh, to, to follow this? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. But the fun is, I, I think I don't have to call on the next generation or to come with a message. I think what you see increasingly that the next generation is calling up upon us. Uh, you've seen Greater Thunberg, you've seen uh, youth movements, we've seen uh, people joining companies and said, hey, uh, how purposeful is your company, otherwise I don't join even, etc. So you see that the young generation uh, is putting some constraints uh, to us and that we don't need to call upon them. And uh, we have seen some companies who said, well, I don't want to be involved, I don't want to do anything, who get problems with their own employees or with hiring new, new people. So I think the young generation realizes, per definition, the future is theirs. Per definition, uh, they contributed less and they pay a bigger bill. And they want us, together with them, now to take action. 
in mitigation and trying to prevent it becomes worse and tools like carbon pricing or uh, reduction targets or transparency helps and developing tools in adaptation um, how to grow crops uh, in droughts in floodings in city protections etc and i think we need to do both and what i like is that there is so much energy so much passion uh, and also so much technologies and innovative power there that if we want we can do that and together between generations together between countries or um, uh, businesses across the world and together private and public sector and i think paul that's what we need to do that's a very hopeful message thank you so much for your time because i do appreciate that you're agenda is very challenging. Uh, hopefully you will keep on inspiring us and being involved in um, uh, learning us to adapt. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching and goodbye.